Okay, very good morning to everyone and happy Valentine's Day. So uh, just a quick heads up for the fellas out there. Don't forget to, um, to stop off at the petrol garage on the way home, pick up some uh, cheap, cheap bottle of plonk and some flowers for your missus. You can thank me later for the reminder. Uh, but just having a, a quick look back to markets then, what have we got on the agenda for, for the briefing? So a bit of an update on the virus. Uh, we're going to talk about German GDP that's just come out and that's the precursor then for the Eurozone number. And then we've got what happened surprisingly yesterday, which was uh, the stepping down of Sajid Javid, the UK Chancellor. So we'll have a little talk about what does that mean uh, potentially for UK assets and the UK government and Brexit. Uh, and then there's quite a busy calendar for today. So just to run through some of the data points and so on uh, to look out for. And then I'll hand you over to Sam to look at the charts from a technical perspective. So um, starting off then, just quickly talking about the virus. Um, quite interestingly, uh, Hubei, so the main kind of epicenter, if you like, of the, the red blob. So if we were to zoom in here, yeah, you probably know the lay of the land quite well now, having looked at this a number of times. So there's Wuhan just on the right hand side. Um, reported cases were up about almost 5,000. You remember it was just around 60k uh, yesterday, but the actual death toll has been revised down. Uh, it's not if that people have been magically revived back to life. Uh, actually, they just lowered the, the number. So still obviously quite questionable. Uh, these numbers aren't really accurate. We all know that. Uh, they're kind of rough guidelines to go with. Uh, but the idea here being that if you're actually looking at the sensitivity of markets as of today to this, uh, it's still relatively benign, I would say. Yesterday, a little bit of a sell-off, but if you look at those uh, US equity charts from really what was the pattern of price activity from yesterday, other than the morning sell-off that we had, as soon as the Americans came in, we just started rallying back higher again. And I, I do think that there are uh, you know, from my experience, having gone through, say, the sovereign crisis um, does kind of reminiscent of this similar type of price action where different geographic regions have different interpretations. And certainly for America, where there's these primaries going on, there's Trump, obviously lots of activity as per usual, there's economic data that's been pretty strong, there's the corporate earnings coming out. You know, unless the number in America of these cases, which, you know, if I just flip over my screen, remember USA had quite a few cases initially, right when the outbreak was beginning, and that number really has not changed one bit. And so for the American market, I think the psyche there, as per generally, you know, the reason why I mentioned the sovereign crisis a few years back, was that you'd get this big kind of maybe uh, European reaction to a subject matter. The Americans would come in, and unless really it was getting to the point of mass escalation of an issue, they were just so much more focused on their domestic uh, kind of information. And I do think that's a little bit the case at the moment. It's kind of this, this situation in China obviously is um, meaningful, but as far as the Americans are concerned, and I think the price action yesterday kind of reflects that, it's just they're focused on other things and on the pecking order of that hierarchy of the most uh, market moving factors it's clear and present a danger, but it's not the biggest one. And these other more positive things are, are, are beating it out at the moment. So still to be monitored, the, the coronavirus, but again, as I said, looking at global stocks as a whole summary, as a kind of a collection of indices, generally we're up about a percent overall. We're heading for the second weekly gain. So despite the kind of usual regular intensity on this subject, global markets you know, barring the exception of some of the mainland perhaps, but even that, the, the Shanghai and Hang Seng up again overnight, only the Japanese market was a little lower in the Asia session. Um, so moving on, what have we had this morning? Um, there's been a couple of things. If I just quickly flip over my chart, we actually have had already the German GDP figure and came in at zero. But if you remember the chart that I was showing you from the graphic that I had in the the, the macro menu report that I issue on a Monday, at that point in time, the analyst expectation was for minus 0 0.2. Remember, we were talking about in previous briefings this idea of uh, the second kind of period of contraction in three. Well, actually then, zero is pretty good. Not, not so much of a bad thing. I mean, obviously, logically speaking, Germany stagnating is not good, but 
comparative to how downbeat and bearish generally people have been on Germany, it could have been a lot worse. So actually, when you look at the, the euro dollar chart, if I quickly just flip over here to the euro dollar currency pair, and if you go to 7 a.m. when this data came out, there was close to zero reaction. And if anything, if you look at it on a shorter time frame, the euro went up. And I think that's fairly reasonable in the short term. Overall, I don't think it really detracts from the trend that euro dollar is presently in. And if I put euro dollar back on a daily continuation chart, remember what we were looking at yesterday? We were basically had confirmed the break of that summer low in euro. And we were talking about, again, this euro dollar chart is completely unaltered. So the, the, the rectangle boxes that we've got there are the same we've had for a number of days. And you can see how technical the market is. You know, you have these little blips, let's say, of, of isolated information, but the overall narrative hasn't changed. At this point in time, the fundamentals are still the, the dollar strength and euro weakness. And so then it's just about being patient. And as per that line, at the 108.52 here in euro dollar, which was those previous highs that we had, I think this is what Sam often refers to as the, the Macron gap up on that first round of the French elections back in April of 2017, we've hit that to the tick. And, and so again, just patience if you were holding that medium term position, all things being equal on the top level, those dynamics for this currency pair uh, have not changed. And, and then here we are down at that point. So a good hold to these levels if you were, if you were in that trade over a slightly longer time frame. Um, this does lead us up then to the Eurozone number. That's going to come out a little bit later on this morning. Um, I don't think there's going to be too much emphasis on this, to be honest. Having had Germany at flat, I'd be expecting this broadly to be in line then with expectations to remain probably around 0.1. Uh, from a range perspective on that piece of data, the flash GDP coming out of the Eurozone, uh, the range is flat to 0.2. So if we did get a flat reading, well, if, if we got a surprise and a negative reading, not sure statistically if that is even possible given the German sitting right at zero. But if we did, then yeah, a retest down at the lower bound of the range that's been in play since the overnight Asia Pacific session on the euro could lead to a bit of a rundown, an extension down to the uh, S1. Okay, moving on, quick look at the UK because uh, I remember I was deliver delivering a lecture yesterday when this actually came out uh, and this was a bit of a bit of a shock really because I was talking uh, this time yesterday about how Suji Javid, uh, Dominic Rabb, these types of characters who sit in the most influential seats in, in the cabinet in the UK government were pretty safe. It was supposed to be a bit more of a formality for them. Uh, absolutely wasn't the case for Suji Javid. Uh, apparently kind of cornered by the PM and, and Dominic Cummings to fire some of his staff in order to more align basically uh, Sajid Javid's own personal treasury team with that of the Prime Minister's economic advisors uh, to bring them more aligned so I, I, I would imagine then so Dominic Cummings can have more direct control over exactly what it is that they're doing and the treasury is a lot more better equipped in terms of the size and depth, let's say, of the department in that sense. So what you would want then uh, is Saji Javid on board, but obviously he was reluctant to fire some of his staff, stuck by his guns, and so he resigned. So what does this mean then going forward? Well, uh, a couple of different things. His replacement is quite key, uh, and the impact. So let's talk about the replacement first, which is this chap here. Uh, you probably would recognise him if you were if you were semi plugged in to the uh, political debates that were happening on TV. He deputised, if you like, for Boris Johnson in those leadership debates. You remember the first couple of rounds we had on ITV and BBC. You know, Boris didn't even turn up. That was how confident he was. He sent in his kind of uh, his next in command on a, on a televised stage, and I'd say Rishi Sunak did a, a pretty decent job. Um, I don't think many people were actually that aware of who he was. He's only 39 years old and he's risen through the ranks pretty quickly, only coming to kind of front bench positions over the last couple of years. Uh, who is he? Well, he's a, he's a former Goldman Sachs employee. I um, haven't actually managed to see what exactly his role was, so I don't know whether um, he was an intern or whether he actually had a bona fide role of seniority or not. I can't really tell you at this point. Um, but 
the key differences here is, is Javid was seen as a fiscal hawk, whereas Sunak is seen much more aligned with Boris and Cummings, giving his stance on Brexit. Sajid Javid was a Remainer, whereas this chap here were voted to leave. Um, his voting history in terms of all the different parts of legislation that we've had to do with Brexit and other debates in, in the lower house, he basically has been an ardent Brexiteer, supports reductions in corporation tax, cuts to capital gains tax. He's gone on the record in favour of infrastructure investment. All of these things then would be much more aligned with the government that would mimic then a little bit more of an approach of uh, fiscal stimulus in a Trump-esque style in order to see you know, the economy flourish. Uh, the opposite then of a fiscal hawk, which would be tightening the belt to make sure that you can afford these changes. So um, as per usual with this type of chap, I mean, obviously people who voted for Brexit in Middle England were voting for you know, Parliament to re represent the normal man in the street. So just like Boris and all the others, this chap went to one of the most expensive, prestigious private schools in Britain, studied at Oxford, went to Stanford University, and he's married the billionaire daughter of the Indian oligarch of Infosys. So yeah, just like you and me, a nice representative of the man on the street, but I'll leave my political persuasions aside. Um, the main thing that this does mean though, is what does it mean for markets? Well, this is the yield on the UK 10-year government bond. Um, and actually, if you see a bit of a, an uptick here, um, it's quite interesting because ultimately um, yields rising to their higher since January after Jav Javid left. You know, this is that idea, this notion then that, that Boris can start kind of changing the game a little bit uh, under the, <laughs> the apparent direction of Cummings uh, and look to tie everything together. Uh, and again, having everyone on board with that same view where they can pull the strings from one direction and one place I think is is quite strategic in that way um, okay going to have a quick overview of the calendar and a few things to to cover off we've already talked about the data forthcoming in a short while at 10 o'clock uh, going into the US session though it is pretty busy today uh, you do have US retail sales coming out they're your major 130 data release uh, you've then got industrial manufacturing uh, data from the US, business inventories, you've got the preliminary University of Michigan sentiment number, then for any oil traders you've got the Baker Hughes rig count as well. Pretty light on the ground in terms of speakers. Um, we do have a, a BOJ member speaking London time at 10 a.m. You've got Fed's Mester, a voter leaning hawk, speaking late afternoon at 4.45 p.m. Um, London time. Um, in terms of some of the equity movers for this morning, uh, we've had AstraZeneca and RBS out of the UK, just having a look at some of the, the actual movers here at the open. RBS are seen down about 2.7, AstraZeneca down about 3.4, um, Renault down about 2.6, the outperformer this morning, EDF is up about 7%. Um, one final interesting comment as well that was just made a short while ago, Bank of England Governor Mark Carney, even though he's outgoing, I do think it was quite interesting in the sense that he said, um, central banks may have to look through one or two quarters of data due to coronavirus impact. Is seeing UK business confidence rebound, some firming up of consumer confidence. The thing that I thought was quite interesting about the Carney comment where, was that even though he's outgoing, I think that that's pretty much a tactic that will be deployed by most of the central bankers. So the ECB, the Federal Reserve and so on. This idea that these central banks have to look through one or two quarters of data meaning then that the likelihood of any near-term policy changes or tweaks, I would say is probably minimal, because it's only then that they've got to see then, well, what is the underlying performance of the economy once you kind of X out the impact and the repricing in of the uh, coronavirus? So, yeah, just thought I'd add that point in. Okay, gonna hand you over to Sam. Um, just bear with me one moment. Okay, hand over to Sam. I wish you a good weekend. I'll see you in the chat room. Thanks very much, guys. Good morning and uh, happy Valentine's Day to, to everyone. Let's have a, a quick look over uh, how things are going. Let's get to start with, uh, with stocks. Uh, overnight, Asia drifted higher, China finishing uh, up for the week just. Um, let's have a, a quick look at 
how we've we've traded. You can see late last night, and this has actually been the the way these markets have traded. In, in some, there has been some decent moves into the into the close. And yesterday, you can see after we did break higher, uh, we came back to test what was the previous high of the day, and and that's acted as a floor uh, to a move to the upside. So keep a watch on that around 33.72. It was. What we were saying yes, there's a, a decent line in the sand for bulls and bears, and you can see once we got uh, above it, the bulls took over. So for me, that's uh, again the line in the, the sand today. Hold that up. We're just trending lower from the the high that we've got. So keep that on. Let's get a little trend line on there. Although not quite yet the the free test that you would like to see. Let's keep a watch to see how uh, how that holds out. Put this onto a 15 minute chart. Let's get a couple of lows in the mix uh, as well. 3380 you could argue that could be maybe a short-term floor or at least a level of interest to, to have marked up and then you're really looking down towards 3360 if uh, that pivot was to go I'd say that would be another area to consider the low that we got to yesterday just about uh, reaching uh, the the high that we had from the 10th albeit not quite uh, and those would really be the levels that I'd focus on same situation uh, for the Dow and the Nasdaq uh, as well Gold yesterday, as we said, started uh, well, pushed higher, and then was really choppy in a range. And uh, this would be still the the lower part of that that I'd uh, focus on. Fifteen seventy five and a half, keep that marked on, and then the the highs that we just couldn't really get through at all. I was doing a, a trade review yesterday around half three, four o'clock, and um, we were saying that uh, it was looking like this level was going to hold, and, and it held again at, at one fifteen. So definitely had that marked up. To, to the upside 1581 uh, on that worth noting Fridays this year have been uh, the worst day of the week for stocks and uh, that could be helpful for gold to push to the upside and just bringing this into the bigger picture it is quite a key resistance zone going back to here to levels not traded since the well other than yesterday of course the the fourth uh, of the month uh, and then above that 1585 could be the, the level to target uh, as well I know we're not near the low at the moment but if we were to push down again stocks pushing higher could be the reason for that probably worth us getting on this trend line again you can see here uh, on the 12th the, both the, the morning and the afternoon before hitting it again not too long ago around half seven this guiding price quite, quite nicely so if we were to break that to the downside you can see a, a quicker move lower the currency as well as we know euro has been pushing lower uh, again today you have the pivot with an area of resistance from a previous day i.e. yesterday that's acted just so well really hasn't it? I mean look at you know if you go back to yesterday fantastic uh, you then break the pivot in the the afternoon on uh, the what day would that be Wednesday acts as a good resistance level Tuesday you don't quite make it but give or take one tick or two and, and that holds up fantastically well and previous days you can just see what a, what a point to, to basically go short if it hits the pivot and you're underneath go short or if it's above and you and you break below it you, know, you go short as well and you'd be very very happy uh, today or well every day really we're in a bit of a range so you got uh, you know think about that that pivot level is a place to go short to continue the trend uh, if we break out the little range that we're into the downside of course start thinking about bigger moves and, and mark up the, the level from uh, Macron's gap uh, as you know I quite like to, to keep saying that uh, there as well so you know not too much going on now I know you've got the data coming out in, in not too long uh, that could really be the main driver here so that's something I would, would keep an eye on but the pivot for me looks pretty good if that was to fail uh, which it hasn't really in, in a while then you could get a, a quicker rally uh, I know it's a relatively small range still, but 108.86 uh, could be the level that that looks uh, to come into uh, as well. The pound, what a day yesterday uh, for the bulls. Is that going to continue or not? I think moves like this, worth getting the fib on, seeing if there's any uh, potential levels to get in, lower down. If there was one that comes in around the pivot, 130.24, that should certainly be of interest. We went through um, a couple of levels just below that yesterday. Uh, around 130 and that would be ultimately where we close the week this is what I want to see can we confirm that we're going to push or you know, break above here um, and if not then I think we, we do push lower ultimately but if we can drift lower down to 130 I know it's 61 ticks away I think from a medium term 
or you know couple day trade perspective that's a, a lovely area to consider to, to get in trend line from the lows as well would uh, match up quite nicely with that and of course if we close the week below not only is the trend line broken that key support as uh, would then potentially turn to resistance again we, and we can push lower to the upside the high of let me just get this on almost reached yesterday but the high of the fifth that's somewhere to have marked up as well 130.84 finishing up on oil before quick looking at, at, at that's what it's doing on the open uh, 50-50 is, is my line in the sand uh, didn't quite make it yesterday morning uh, finished the week above there you know you'd be very relatively happy to still be long whether you want to hold that risk over the weekend or not is, is another question what you'd be really happy with is if we can get above 52 bucks that would be really nice for, for any oil bulls if you're you know bearish if we can get back below that 50-50 fantastic <coughs> opportunity maybe to get short to target some of these lows uh, that we've already had this year uh, looking intraday at the little range that we're in it's it's you know the markets are open up relatively quiet it's almost waiting for <coughs> sorry something to to happen price just getting squeezed in here from those lows a break of that is potentially an opportunity uh, or a break of the upside as well uh, but range bound trade this may not happen really until the afternoon quick look at the DAX to wrap it uh, quiet trending lower from those highs much like the US equities as well let's see if we can get a bit of a trend on there from that high it's respected enough a little false break uh, on the open understandably so keep a watch on that a break above there and it could lead to uh, you know, another push and unbelievably still that would be another all-time high for DAX what can stop uh, you know this market uh, and let alone the uh, the US equities as well but a couple of levels below to obviously have marked up as well the lines in the sand for, for the DAX I mean I would argue this is as good as any here 13,712 uh, be looking at that as well any questions as usual please do let us know good luck to the guys in Sage 2 today trading competition this is where heroes are made there's no prizes for coming second um, apart, well there is a prize for coming last a nice wooden spoon uh, but we all know it's all about getting that first prize 20 contracts uh, limit on each product full futures likely going to be a bloodbath but uh, I hope everyone has a good day uh, and I look forward to, to catching you all next week I'm on, on the mic.